Today we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna take a trending topic right now, which is the trading card industry, how much it's been booming, and if you're looking to get into the hobby, what is the best way to go about it, whether it's as a hobby or as an investment. I hope you all enjoy this, especially if you're getting into cards or just had done it as a kid and maybe brings back some good memories. So we're bringing in John, better known as the basketball card guy right now. Guys, I'm telling you, if you go to Basketball Card Guys page on Instagram or anywhere else on the internet, you're just going to be just wowed with everything that he has. And I, I just thought it was really cool because it's almost like looking at like almost like a museum, right? Because you have the jersey cards, the patch cards, you have so many different types of, of valuables, including those 4,000 Michael Jordans, <laughs> which I got to know, how long did it take you to get all those? I mean, just continually over time. I mean, it's been probably 25, 30 years of just continually collecting and just, and the, the crazy thing is I have a photographic memory, which is great for this hobby because I can see a card and I can know if I have it or not. Even though I have 4,000, I still find Jordans. I got one the other day that I did not have. I literally got a card that I didn't have in that collection yet. Um, and so like, that's really important too. It's like knowing what you have and what you don't have. Um, some of my friends, even some of my customers from the website, like I know their collections even better than they do because of that up here. Um, so they'll ask me, they'll be at a show and then come to my booth and say, hey, someone, someone over in another booth has this card. Do I have it already? <laughs> They're asking me. It's not even my collection, but I, I know. I'm like, no, actually, you don't have that one. <laughs> so um, it's nuts. But again, it's like it's a, a visual thing and, and it's just a passion thing. You know, you're collecting something that you love, something that brings you happiness, uh, and enjoyment. And and I appreciate the kind words about the collection online. I mean, I've collected a pretty diverse set of basketball stuff. I'm not, I don't just stick to cards. Uh, I do mostly card stuff, but, but even the types of cards, as you were mentioning, the autographs and the patches, they've evolved so much in the last several years that if people are thinking, if they hear the term like basketball cards or sports cards, they're probably initially picturing a piece of cardboard with a picture on it and like, ah, oh, how much can that really be worth? It's just a piece of cardboard. When you see how involved the cards are today, I mean, it gets into the intricacies and they, they take a piece of the player is what they're doing in a lot of ways. I'll show you one card. It's my favorite card out of my collection, but it exemplifies, yeah, yeah. it's my best Jordan. Um, it exemplifies everything um, that a card can be these days. So this card's out of Exquisite Collection, which is one of the top uh, sets ever made by Upper Deck. They were very expensive. I, at the time, I think they were about $2,500 a pack. You got six cards in a pack for $2,500. That shows you the evolution, go from $2 packs to $2,500. That is um, Now I don't think you can get them less than ten grand a pack. I mean, they're insanely expensive. But this card, you know, combines a photograph of the player uh, with some really beautiful foil around it, a nice design, but then it has a piece of a game used jersey that Michael Jordan actually wore in an NBA game, along with a patch. A patch is a stitched portion of the jersey. So not just like the normal section, but like actually like an area that would have stitching on it. Um, and then he personally autographed right on the card as well. They made 50 of these in the world. So I have one out of the 50. Um, but you can see wow. like everything from the autograph. Wow, that's um, damn. Beautiful, bold blue, signed in 2006, still gorgeous. You know, it's kept out of the light. Um, and then a patch right from his jersey, and that's right off of the number three on the jersey. If, it's up, if you, like, twist it upside down, you can kind of see where it comes from. Um, and then a great picture, a smiling pose of Jordan, you know, right there. Number 38 of 50, they actually serial numbered this card. They serial number a lot of cards now to show you just how limited they are which is one of those evolutions as well that's kind of neat um, for people that are wondering because like the, the Jordan rookie card, there's tens of thousands of, even though people think of it as like a super rare card, it's actually not that rare. Um, and a lot of the modern cards today, they're trying to give you the actual limitations so that you can kind of make good decisions on them. So Yeah, here's what I love about you is that you had brought up that this is something that you love and it's just been a passion. You've been doing it for so long. When people hear about how sports trading cards are blowing up and how they should get into it and they should invest and go buy as many packs as they possibly can. I don't think that they realize just yet that 
it's not like you go to a Target and pick up one pack of cards and then you hit the lottery. You right. have to consistently buy these packs. You have to consistently collect over time like you did with all your Jordans in order to grow what you have. So it's not like That's you just true. go and you strike gold. Right. I, and there are people, I mean, it's the lottery is actually a great way to kind of compare it because there are people that like the lottery, open one pack of cards and end up with something very large. And then there's a lot of other people that will open pack after pack after pack after pack and get nothing worth as much as what they just spent on the pack. So it is a gamble when you're opening packs at that level. I haven't opened packs since the 90s. I mean, that's how much I shifted my mindset. Um, opening packs is pretty addictive. I got to say it's sim very similar to gambling because you get that rush and you pull something amazing and you get that, that ROI back. You're like, oh, I just pulled this thing. I mean, you only get the ROI if you're willing to sell it. That was my problem always when I was a kid. Like I pulled a great card. It was worth all this money. And then I'm not willing to sell it. I can't part with this. There's no ROI there. <laughs> There's yeah. no ROI. It's still mine. I'm not <laughs> selling it. There's no money coming back. But it really is. It's it's And a lot of people, I think the biggest problem right now with people kind of jumping into the industry because they hear it's hot is they're listening too much to the crowd. And so about a year ago, there was a real push towards Luka Doncic's prism rookie card it's a very common rookie that um, came out of the uh, panini prism packs they were a retail pack they were a hobby pack meaning you could get them in target and walmart you could also get them in a standard kind of sports hobby store um, so that's a distinction between retail and hobby the companies make two versions uh, of packs uh, generally they used to put a lot more in the hobby packs now they're putting kind of an equivalent mix between hobby and retail because retail has gotten a, a much bigger push. Even still, this card was a, what we call a base card, meaning it was the most basic of the cards. It was a normal card, not an insert, not something that had like crazy odds or was very rare, but his standard card that came out of this set that I bought for 50 cents a piece when it first came out, that's how much I was spending on them. Uh, they had a book value. So they have, they, there's a book that follows like values on all this stuff. It's not used very often anymore. And, and maybe it should be used more. We can talk about that. But um, the book value on them was about $20. And people started getting these cards. They started grading them, which is the process of sending them into a third party authenticator and grader who examines the card and gives it a numerical grade. So they're, they're basically grading it like a test. They look at a few different things and they say, you got a nine, it's a mint nine or a 10, it's a gym mint 10. And those grade values can really change a lot of the value in the card because of how rare it is. And so these people were taking a brand new card that I bought for 50 cents that you could buy in general, you know, a couple months later for $20 was the book value. That was the most people were spending on it. They sent it away to get graded. They'd spend somewhere between $10 and $25 to get the card graded, depending on the time they sent it in. And then they get it back, and it came in a graded case. So you'd get it back in a, in a case like this. This is a PSA case, where they have a numerical grade on the top uh, and description and otherwise uh, on it. This Luka Doncic card that was coming back like that, um, the tens, again, went from $0.50, cents, $20 over time, the tens we're selling for $2,000, a very common card, $2,000. And so the grading companies keep track of how many grades they give out for each card. And if you look up that Luca, it's now has over 16,000 gem mint tens. Not that they just graded 16, there's 16,000 of them that have the gem mint distinction because it's a brand new card fresh out of the pack. Never had the chance to get beat up, you know, on, on bike tires or whatever people used to do. <laughs> like people knew it was valuable. Like the cards were valuable when they first bought them. So those cards were selling for 2000. So a lot of the new investment folks came in and bought those. And there are plenty of them to buy. I mean, there's 16,000 of them. And so that's where I feel like some of the ill advisement comes there. There was a whole crop of um, investment groups that came up. There are people online that have a whole video series telling you what cards to buy and how much to spend when people don't really think about peeling that back to realize, well, wait a minute, is that self-serving? Are they telling you to buy something they already have a hundred of and that you're actually raising the market so they can sell their own? All sorts of that kind of crooked stuff has been taking place over the last year or so that's really juiced up the market in a way that um, has got it to these new heights. 
Yeah, no, this is why I was so happy that you were pumped to come onto the show because I just thought you were the perfect person to describe all these different situations to the listeners and the viewers out there so that they can learn a little bit about the hobby. Coming from somebody who has this insane collection that you could probably sell off for who knows how many hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, but you're doing it because you love it and you're doing it because you enjoy the hobby, you're passionate about it. Yeah, It's not like you're one of these investor type people who are just going right. to buy one of those Luka Doncic cards and just hoping that he does well. So yeah. this insight that you're given is just so valuable and just so interesting too, you know? Like uh, like like you said, a lot of it kind of goes on what ill-advised people are saying. So if they're hyped up about a LaMelo Ball, well, guess what? LaMelo Ball rookie cards, just the base card by Panini right now, like I saw a posting for $1,000 and it's it's nothing special. It's, it's, it's not thick. It's not a chrome. It's not yeah. a jersey patch. Not, nothing like special. But yeah. those are just going to flood the market. We saw that last year with Zion. He yeah. hadn't even played an official NBA game yet. And his card went from $50 up to like three or 400. He hadn't played a game. He was out injured. Like, as you were saying, like you, you, the, the traditional thought would be, let me buy this. And if the player does well, it'll go up. The cards were going up and the player hadn't even played a game yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like, I joked, my parents were asking me because they saw a story on a Zion card and they said, do you have any Zion cards? I said, no, I don't. And they said, why not? And I said, I don't know. I, I said, they said, but he's got to have something going for him, right? I mean, like his stuff is so valuable we're hearing. And I said, yeah, he's actually, you know, statistically speaking, he's never missed a shot in an NBA game. And that was a true stat because he hadn't played an NBA game yet. <laughs> so, so. I guess we're both uh, we're both that way too, right? We're in that zone too. <laughs> yeah, we're in that. We don't have cards of us, you know, in the uh, in the packs, but you know, maybe someday we can we can state that claim too. But yeah, so stuff like that, it's just it's and, and I under I understand people that you know are speculating, and that's what a lot of investors do. I mean, it's all about speculation, but it's it just it. I don't know. As a hobbyist, I've always collected what I loved. I always collected what I believed in, and to me, the question that I always ask. Whenever I buy anything, whether it's today, yesterday, or back in the 90s when I was working in the store, was if I, uh, would I rather have that card that I'm buying or the cash? And if I pay this cash for that card, am I happy with keeping that card for forever? That's what I always ask myself. And that's the test that I do. Because does that card bring me enough happiness, enough joy looking at it, having it in the collection that I'm willing to give up this amount of money for it? And so, you know, so I've never really, I like to say I'm an unintentional, you know, investor in it because yes, I do have a large collection that I'm sure is worth a ton right now if I like kind of parse it all out. But like, to me, it's just been things that I picked up when I could afford them and that I loved. And it just so happened. And I tell this to a lot of people, the things that you like, other people are going to like too. It's, it's no accident why I like Michael Jordan. I'm not the only guy that likes Michael Jordan. I mean, people that like talk about it now are like, oh yeah, well, sure you collect Jordan. Everyone collects Jordan. It's like, yeah, but you know, but doing it from the nineties and continuing all the way on, a lot of people dropped off, um, you know? And so if you collect what you like or what you really love in it, I always tell people that you really don't lead yourself astray. Um, the other thing is don't pull money out of the bank you know, don't, don't take money out of a, a fund that you have towards buying a house or your family, or don't go sell your car, you know, to put money in the cards. Um, you know, it, it's, it is a market at this point and it's, it's really volatile. I mean, if you look at, at just what's happened in the last few months about it, how extremely things have gone up, you have to figure like any market, the only reason things are a market is if they go up and down, right? I mean, that's what makes a market. So you have to realize that things can come down just as quickly. Um, you know, so the stuff that you buy, you should, you should enjoy, or you should have a place for, I always felt, you know, but that comes from the hobbyist approach, not the kind of investor approach. Which is probably one of the reasons why I give such great advice. And uh, one thing that I've noticed while checking out your social media pages and just hopping on some of the live streams and seeing posts that you've been tagged on is that you have such a great reputation within the hobby community, which obviously says a lot about you, but you Thanks, give yeah. honest answers. You're an honest person. You're just a good dude. So for anybody who's looking to get into this hobby right now, we got five questions that we're going to ask John awesome. just to give his take. They're kind of general, but there's a lot of people who are looking to get into this hobby or who have just gotten into it. 
and they want some answers and also too they want to do as well as they possibly can in 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 the in the hobby and investment side of these things so sure. the first question that i want to hit you with is and and i know a lot of the answers to these but uh just for you to give it since this is your yeah. bread and butter but <laughs> So the first question for you, John, is where is the best place to buy cards? Well, it's there's a good mix of places you can get them. The biggest marketplace right now is eBay because that's where the majority of single cards go. Um, and so they find them themselves there over time. You've got Golden Auctions as well that has ultra high-end cards traditionally. And that may change soon as things change there. Um, but right now you can find some really, really tough gems. The, the other day, a... Kobe Bryant um, Black Label uh, 10 sold. I think it's the only one in existence, this Chrome Refractor, very rare card. So some people will take the ultra high stuff there. Um, so that's a good space too. Um, local card shops are actually a really great place you can find a good deal on a card. Um, so a lot of local card shops, you can look them up on Google, you know, around where you live and see, search for baseball cards, search for sports cards. Um, and see if you can find a local hobby shop. A lot of them will have a, like a separate case of singles that you can grab cards from. Um, you know, and again, I advise people to really go after players that they like as opposed to buying the packs. Um, there are a number of places you can buy packs from. Um, there are online retailers that do it. If you get lucky enough to get a retail pack at Target or Walmart, which is almost impossible now, because there's guys that literally camp out there just to buy them to resell them to hobby shops. It's getting nuts. Um, but those are really the top spots or uh, a local show. You know, like if you go, if you can find, there's, um, I think Sports Collectors Digest, I think is the name of it. Um, if you search like your state name and sports card show in Google, it's like the first result. And they will list, they have a whole calendar by state of card shows. Some of these things are like small, like 20 tables, you know, they're not big shows, but you can still find something that you like there um, and you could get a good deal on. Um, with any of these things, like if you're going to collect, if you're going to put money into it, know what things are worth, you know, like um, do some research ahead of time. And almost everybody at this point is looking at what they call eBay comps. Um, and so going on eBay, looking at what um, has sold what it's sold for to get an idea. Um, but you gotta, you gotta dive deep even there to understand what the true value in some cases is. So there's two things that you said that kind of just stuck out to me. One was yeah. buying an individual player rather than pack. So yeah, I'll, I'll use this guy as an example. Uh, huge baseball fan. His name's Sean. Uh -huh. And he's got all these Aaron Judge cards, all the serial numbered ones, all from, I believe it was the 2019 or 2020 top series. Uh, baseball uh, series uh -huh. one and, and series two but he said that he learned the hard way that it's better to buy the individual cards rather than buying the packs because you could buy thousands of packs and still not get any of the cards that you're looking for so if you're going to put your money somewhere you might and you want something very specific you might as well just try to find the individual player and then That's the other thing too is that if you don't have a local hobby store your best bet is like a Target or a Walmart, but nowadays it's just impossible for any to, anybody to buy cards there. And in my opinion, that kind of stinks for the younger generation because take yourself, for example, when you're 14, you're running a card store, but a lot of these kids who are 14 years old right they now and they go to the pack. store, yeah, they can't afford a pack or they can't find them. Yeah, it, it is. It's totally crazy. Um, and and part of that, it's so funny, I'll tell you another area you can buy cards from, which is also partially to blame for that whole issue. But there's a, a new kind of retail zone, which is called a breaker. And that's a person that will buy a box. So they'll buy a whole box of packs. They will then break the box open and they will sell before they break it. They pre-sell specific teams or players to specific people. So if you were a Yankee fan, along with liking Aaron Judge, you could pick the Yankees in a break. And so instead of spending $500 on the box, you spend maybe $60 on the Yankees. And then you get every Yankee card that comes out of that box when the breaker opens it. That's great as a solution currently for people that are trying to do kind of an in-between like, oh, I want the chance of getting something great for less, uh, but I don't want to put like a ton of money into it. And at the same time, it's the reason the box prices are so high. 
So if we take something like NBA hoops, uh, about a year ago, or a little more than a year ago, a box of NBA hoops, 36 packs, sold for $80 in a hobby shop, 80 bucks. So a little over $2 a pack. Um, you could buy that whole box yourself, rip it open yourself, open all 36 packs, and you keep every card for $80. Once the breakers got involved, that $80 box got purchased, and then they'd sell off teams for like $10 a team. And you know, at home are like, well, I don't need the other cards in that box. I only care about my one or two teams. I'd rather spend the $10 and get just the team I want than spend $80 and have a bunch of waste. So, but if you look at how many teams you've got, you're approaching like 30 teams, right? So you're putting the breakers getting from you, you know, somewhere between, depending on how many they sell, but like, let's say roughly like 24, 26, 28 uh, teams worth. So 200, you know, let's say $50 on average. They paid 80 bucks for the box. Now they get 250 back from everyone buying into it. Now the card stores are hearing this and they go, well, why are we selling the boxes at $80? If the breaker can sell it for 250, you know, they're getting 250 back. Why don't we sell it for 150? <laughs> and then the card company goes, why are we selling the card boxes so cheap? If someone's willing, <laughs> and it's just, and this has gone on and on and on. And, and it's, and, and it keeps cycling back. And so now cycle. that same box of hoops are selling for like this year's hoops now is selling between 600 and a thousand dollars a box. Went from 80 to a thousand. That's crazy. And, but again, it's the person at home and, and it's, it's happened gently over time, but the person at home is like, well, if I have to spend $40 on my team, it's not a big deal you know, it's still better than having to spend a thousand dollars on the box. You see what I mean? Like, and so this is how we've gotten so far away from it. So the breakers are a solution to the current problem, but they've also actually <laughs> created a large portion of the current problem as well. And then as the box prices have gone up, then the singles, the cards that you get inside the boxes have also followed suit. So now people, when they open up a pack, they if that pack isn't costing $2 anymore, now it's $15 to open a pack or $20 to open a pack. The cards inside, they expect to sell for more as well. Wow. Yeah. Jeez, I can see how that could just be a never-ending cycle, like you said. The price sensitivity, no one thought was going to be this far apart. Um, and it just keeps stretching. It's like a, it's, you know, that's why some people like they, they talk about, you know, like the, the market ballooning or that, you know, it's certain areas of it are certainly inflated so far beyond where anyone would have thought. Um, but the price sensitivity isn't there. People are still willing to take the gamble. So using that as an example for the next question, um, right now we're seeing a lot of other sports outside of the four major pro sports in North America blow up, whether it's yeah. tennis or golf or soccer, soccer's, soccer's a global sport. So stuff. that could, yeah, that could go yeah. crazy. But if you're just getting into us, or but if you're just getting into this, what should you be buying? And I know what you're gonna say, and you I do. feel the same exact way. Yeah, but, you should buy what you like, what you yes. love, what resonates yep. with you. You know, if if someone told me, and they did, plenty of people reached out to me early on when the soccer stuff started to take off. Oh, you gotta buy soccer, and I'm like, no, I really don't. <laughs> I don't know anything about <laughs> soccer. I watch the World Cup, you know, occasionally, but it's not my sport. Nothing against it. It's just not my sport, you know. So, like, it, it, it's just, yes, absolutely, you can make money in that. You can make money in buying Bitcoin. You can make money in buying stocks. You can be making money in buying anything. But what's so cool about the card hobby is you get something physical when you're invested in it. When you buy a card, you get the card. I have that Jordan patch. I have a piece of a jersey he wore in a game and he signed the card. That's something special that I have while I also have the value. So, uh, you know, like you should have the things you want, not a bunch of stuff you don't. I I'll give you one quick story on that. I, I think that kind of illuminates it. Um, back when I was working in the store, when I was in high school, I was introduced to a distributor who was the guy in charge of bringing in the boxes and stuff that we bought through. A lot of people are just the quick kind of how it works. A card company sells boxes to a distributor. A distributor sells them to the stores. So this was, as a store, we went to this distributor and I got to visit his home, which is where he had his business. He had a three car garage, three bays. 
and spread out with crazy amounts of shelves of awesome, they call it wax, they, the, the boxes of packs everywhere. And over time, uh, in the 90s, cards were, you know, kind of, they, the market wasn't as strong on them. So he gave up a garage bay to something that was much stronger in value at the time. And again, this comes back to this, this, this point of why you should stick with what you love and what you know. This grown man had a garage full of Beanie Babies. I mean, a garage full, like takeover. Like he should open a Hallmark, you know, strip mall on its entirety. It was insane. And I went in there and I'm like, why do you have so many stuffed animals? Like, it's weird. And they're all like pink and like, they were not like this guy at all. You know, he had no interest in them. And he's like, oh, I make a ton of money off of them. Well, a year later, the guy was stuck with them. He has a garage full of these things that dropped in value and he's stuck with just a bunch of kids' toys, <laughs> you know? So again, like it would be one thing if he was passionate about that, if he had kids that loved them or whatever it is, like sure, then buy. But he was, he was taking himself out of that seat and getting into the greed seat and figuring out, well, how can I make the most money here? And so he bought a bunch of stuff he didn't care about, so. That's a great example. And I think another really good example too is that if you love a sport, so say you love baseball. Mm -hmm. I'm going to know while watching uh, a 162 game regular season, who are the good players? Who are not the good players? Who's on a hot streak? Who's not on a hot yeah. streak? Who's a, who's a young top prospect? Like I'll know that stuff. So if I were to collect baseball cards, I'll see a player that a lot of people never heard of. And I'll know this is a good guy. This is somebody who I should hold on to. Whereas yes. if I were to try to collect basketball and go into your world, well, mm -hmm. I don't know anything about Tyler Harrow. I don't know anything about uh, Cassius Stanley and, and a lot of these young players who yep. you would definitely know much more about. So the realization of what is hype and what's not hype and what you should be investing in and not investing in if you're doing this for the money, it's just, it's, it's a world of difference uh, when it comes to collecting something that you love and because you enjoy it versus... Yeah investing in your collection because you want to make money. Exactly. Exactly. Boom. Next one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you have this great collection. You just got a bunch of cards that you want to get graded and you're not sure which cards to get graded. Which ones do you get graded out of your collection or, or, or do you get any graded at all? So I, I always tell people, like, I personally won't grade cards for my personal collection. There's very few exceptions to that, but uh, it's for a couple of reasons. One, grading costs money. Um, two, it's, um, it's putting a card in a container. Like, so here, you've got a graded card container here. And people, like, they, they look at this as like, well, it's really safe in there because it's all nicely, tightly packed in that container. What they don't realize is that the UV protection on these cases is very similar to other cases you can buy. And it only lasts about five years. So when you put a card in this forever, um, you're protecting it against some of the elements, but you're not actually protecting it against all. So if you left this card out in the sun, and we've seen a lot of examples of this, um, if you leave it out in a showcase and you go do a lot of shows, the card will start to change color inside the grading case um, if it's been left out too long only because they, they can't put enough of that um, protectant in there without yellowing the whole case. The more UV protection it has, the more yellow the case would be. Um, and so obviously a yellow case of a card would look ugly. <laughs> Not something you'd want to show. You know, wouldn't want to showcase a card in a yellow case. It wouldn't look as good. <laughs> um, so I prefer having my cards in, in cases that you can remove, replace much more easily. And it doesn't cost any money. And you're not sending away cards that could get lost in the mail, all of that kind of stuff. Now, there are reasons to grade. Grading cards adds value if you get a good grade back on it. So for people out there that are thinking about grading a card, maybe they have a Jordan rookie that they just found and they're like, oh man, I wonder, wonder is this a $700,000 card or is it a $5,000 card? You know, um, Grading makes that determination because that's a third party telling you what condition that card is in. And that's a case, if you're looking to sell a card, there's a lot of upside to grading because it can add a lot of value. There's downside too. You know, you can send out a card and get back a, a way worse grade than you thought you were going to get on the way back. 
Uh, I don't have the sample here yet, but I did my very first PSA grading order that I've sent out myself. I've done stuff through other people in the past, but I sent out a Jordan rookie card um, about a week and a half ago on their two day service, which by the way, everything is backlogged. There's millions of cards in line at, at one of the grading companies right now waiting to get graded. It can take up to a year to get a card back at this point. That's how backed up everything is. Um, but I paid for the Super Express two-day service, which is actually two weeks at this point instead of two days. Wow. Um, it, yeah, and I took a card that was a in a Beckett case. So Beckett's another grading company. Um, it was a 3.5 uh, well-centered rookie card, had bad corners, um, and had some staining on the back of the card. Um, Beckett gave it a 3.5. They give it a 9 for centering. They show you subgrades on Beckett's grading. On PSA, they don't. And so I was hopeful that the way that I've heard the PSA grades that I might get a four or a five on this card and that the value might actually rise up quite a bit being in a PSA case because it's preferred right now. That changes too, but right now it's preferred um, and it could get a higher grade. Just found out this morning, they graded it a 1.5. Oh no. Which is amazing to me. Like looking at the card myself, I'm wondering how it got that low because they show examples on their website and they show like if there it usually has bends in the card or this, that, and the other thing. And this didn't have any of that. Um, so that leads me to the other point about grading. Totally subjective. You can send the same card in, even to the same grading card company, three or four times and get three or four totally different grades without doing anything to the card differently. Um, they have human beings looking at them. They have policies in place and they're all trained. So it's inconsistent. I mean, you've got human beings that are doing all of this stuff. They're looking at the cards um, and you can have the same card go in three different times and end up with three different grades it, in the same company. You know, it's, so it, it's very subjective. And, um, and they do have ways that they train their folks on how to, you know, to obviously to look for certain things. When you grade a card, it's four things that they look at. It's corners, it's edges, it's uh, surface and it's centering are the four that they look at. Um, so they're looking in depth at each of those. Um, and look, each time it goes in, it could get something different. And that's, that's the other part of it that I don't like. You know, I'd, I'd much rather they use technology or something really tied to it that you knew every time you sent the same thing in, it was gonna come back consistent. Even if it was consistently lower, at least you know, like you weren't cheated out of a grade, you know? Yeah, so, something with um, no human error. Who knows if, exactly. if maybe you get a grader one day who, had a bad morning or something or like, I don't even know, but like yeah. is, is in a bad mood or didn't have his coffee that morning. And, and the graders are paid the least out of everyone at their company, which is another piece that mess is kind of messed up when they are the bread and butter of the business. You gotta, like I was looking on Glassdoor, like you gotta figure out, like you gotta give these people more. Oh, um, for sure. Especially if the cards that they're holding are selling for a ton of money. Yep. And there's, there's all sorts of things, too, that have come about. There's an FBI investigation going on right now because one of the largest card consigners on the Internet was in bed with one of the grading card companies at one point, and they were sending trimmed cards. So cards that uh, where there was a bad edge or a bad corner, someone just sliced it off with a razor blade, um, made the card a little bit shorter, and then they were pushed through anyway and given grades nonetheless, which is these card companies are not supposed to grade a card if it's been altered. The only grade they'll give it is altered and they won't have a numeric grade on it. Um, so there's so much of that kind of stuff that, I don't know, it just, I personally, I like the cards to the cards. I'm a card purist and I'd rather spend the extra money that it takes to go grade a card and all of the insurance and all that and put it towards more cards. <laughs> I'd rather do that, you know, so. No, especially with the, the boosted prices recently. I know PSA had just doubled them because they doubled them the following week after I had put together my submission order, which I've only graded cards once before, but I was just, I was so relieved that I got it in right before they had doubled the prices. And when I was submitting all the cards, the way that I was kind of going about it was I want these for my personal collection and then probably some I'll eventually flip or if it's, if it's not a player that I love or I have no yeah. emotional connection to it, I'll get rid of it. But also there's just this kind of cool, piece of art type of, of feel to it, seeing a card, whether it doesn't matter what kind of case it's in, but like if you have it in your home office or kind of like where you're shooting right now, like yeah. it looks so cool. You know what I mean? 
it does have a cool consistency too. If you get them all graded by the same company, it's it's kind of a, a cool piece too. Um, no, for sure. And I and I totally get all of that that end. And look, if you if you get some of those back and they're gem tens, you may find the same situation I was in recently with some of the cards that I've had put away for a long time, where the market is so high on them that you'd rather have the money than the card. It comes back to that initial question that I always pose: Would you rather have the card or the money? And it may get to the point that the value of the card in the current market is so high that you'd rather have the money than the card. And that's totally okay. You, you can put it towards other cards if you want to. You can put it towards your home, your family, whatever. You know, like there does come a point where, where those things happen. You know, I'm not like actively looking to sell off my collection, but I've been over the course of the last few years pulling stuff out of my personal collection. People call it the PC, um, pulling out of that PC you know, and making stuff available when I have multiple autographs of the same player or multiple rookie cards, you know? Yeah. And it could also do be one of those things where if, if say you submit a hundred cards and you get one of them back, that's going to sell for the cost of what it cost to get all those cards graded. Well, Pay then you can, yeah, exactly. So then you get 99 cards that you get to keep and do whatever it is that you want with it, which absolutely that brings me into my fourth question. What cards should people buy slash invest in? So we're talking serial numbered cards, rookie cards, autographed cards, patch patch cards, jersey cards. What would you say to somebody? I mean, it depends how quickly they're looking to get out of them. So if they're looking for a short-term investment, then you look at the waves that are going on. And a lot of it is going to focus around rookie cards. A lot of it's going to focus around grading. Um, if you have a good eye for cards, uh, a lot of people that I know, they come to my website and do this right off of it. They look at a card really closely or photos of the card and they go, hmm, that would grade well. They buy the card raw, so ungraded. They then send it off to the grading company. It comes back a nine or a 10 and they can triple, quadruple, you know, quintuple their money pretty quickly just by grading it. Um, so I'd say rookies are rookies and graded cards are the areas in which you can do very quick kind of investment opportunity short term. Uh, that's where the most you'll see is. Um, long term, you want to look at things that are actually rare. So short term, the Luka Doncic prism was a great thing for people. Like they could flip that, move around as that, that thing kept climbing. Um, long term, it's not a great option because there's so many of them out there. Eventually, the supply of them will exceed the demand. People just won't be that interested anymore and there's 16,000 people with gem 10s that are like, no, no, please take it. Um, so eventually that comes down. The stuff that kind of lasts longer are the numbered cards. So the ones that are actually serial numbered. Um, autographs for sure, patches for sure. Um, things that are unique, things that from the hobby standpoint, so hobbyists tend to stay longer in the market than an investor does. So someone like me, who's been interested in this since I was a kid, and a lot of the people that I talk with are people that may have left the hobby for a while and are now coming back in because it's getting hot again. And they're like, oh, I do want that card. Um, those guys are going to be focused around the actually rare cards. And that's something that, you know, I think is so important that you separate what's rare and what's not when thinking about the long term. And then the players. You're taking a big gamble, you know, uh, investing in someone like Obi Toppin right now, like a rookie that's just out this year. Um, yes, that can pay off for you really well if they end up climbing and their values go way up. Um, but it can also kind of stink. I, I usually wait six months into a season before I even touch a rookie. So I don't have rookies from this year. I haven't touched them at all yet. Um, you know, back a few years ago in 2017, I hadn't touched any. And then Jason Tatum was doing really well in the playoffs. And I picked up a bunch of his stuff then. Um, his stuff kind of dropped off for a while. But then in the last year, it's picked way back up again. And people are like, oh, how'd you know he was going to be big? And I'm like, because he was. He was playing extremely well. It's exactly what you said, Matt. Like, <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you watch the game, it's not rocket science. You can see who excites you in it. You can see their attitudes about the game. Um, I collect Thomas Bryant, who is a very random kind of collection. He's out for the rest of the season now. So his cards are coming way down, but I pick him up still. Cause I think he's a good guy. He's on the Washington wizards and he was a guy, uh, the only one, I think in the last 20 years to have a perfect game in the NBA 14 for 14. Uh, the last one before him was like Gary Payton 20 years earlier. Um, he's 
awesome at the shooting. He's a great kind of spirit among the team. He was on the Lakers, did nothing really on the Lakers. They dropped him to the G League. He made a splash there, got brought on to the Washington Wizards, and to me was just an exciting guy. So I made him a player to watch on my website, and he sent me a video thanking me for making him a player to watch on the website. Ooh. So then I was like, all right, well, I got to collect more of his cards now. You know, so <laughs> I haven't sold any of them. Like they're, they're, they're my personal collection. They're very inexpensive for me to buy. Um, so I would also advise that too. Like I've always had kind of a side personal collection as well as my main. So like Michael Jordan is my main Kobe Bryant since 1996 has been one of my main collections. Um, so those two are like really solidly in there and Kevin Durant since his rookie year in 07, I collected heavily as well. Three big players that are star players that a lot of people collect. But then I've got like the Thomas Bryant's of the world. Chauncey Billups was someone that I collected for years when I couldn't afford the Jordans, you know? So when I couldn't afford to buy, you know, the, the car that I shared earlier, you know, the, the, uh, the Jordan um, out of exquisite, I bought five Chauncey Billups of that car <laughs> because they were inexpensive, they were $40 a piece. And I was like, this is great. The packs are like two grand. I can buy a car that I really like out of $40. I'm going to do that, you know? And yeah. so I have a cool collection of his stuff still. And he's a good guy too. You know, he does a lot of things, even in New York still, he's got an organization, you know? So collect who you like, you know, go after that kind of stuff. I always like to say, I, I like to collect good people, not just good players. So if they're doing something great in the community, it kind of just shows like, like Billups, like he's in broadcasting now, it kind of just shows that they're going to last beyond, you know, the league and that they, that they'll, you know, they'll be good for a long time. No, for sure. No, that's a good point to it. And, and we even seen it with a lot of documentaries, whether it's the last dance on Netflix, uh, just how people all of a sudden become, even more big on a player like Dennis Rodman or Scottie Pippen, and then their st stock starts to rise, or just like you said, the broadcast side of things. If you're seeing Shaq every night, well, you're kind of more connected. You want more of Shaq right. memorabilia. Right. <laughs> so the next question in terms of uh, maybe not so much of purchasing a certain player or a team or, or an item off of eBay, but I want to put you in a situation because I think that this is important for a lot of listeners to hear because shelves at target and walmart have been getting cleared out by a lot of people who go and flip and in order for this hobby to continue to grow it's extremely important for young kids to be able to actually purchase these packs and find these packs so you walk into target or walmart your re retail store you see uh, a, a new fresh stock of a bunch of sports cards what do you do at this point that's the thing that probably wouldn't happen. I would love most of the ones around our area. Actually, now they're putting up signs that limit you to one or up to three per customer, which is great. So what I would love to do is just have a sign on me to stick up if they don't have one that says you can't buy these. <laughs> you can't buy more than one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point, I would buy one, you know, if it was something that I was really going to open. But again, I don't open packs in general. Um, I would likely call a friend that was interested in opening them um, and then leave the rest would be my, my point of view on that. Um, in the past, you know, like, and I've done that in the past too. Like I posted social media things when I found like a whole thing of prism two years ago. And I was like, I bought my one, my one box here, the little blaster box and I'm leaving the rest, you know, like pay it forward. Like, come on guys, everyone can have some. Um, it is really troubling though, because the realization is the minute I leave, five minutes later, someone probably will come in and clear off the whole shelf if they don't have that policy. Um, so it is, it is disturbing. Um, but, you know, there's not a lot other than the stores making these policies. I remember going into a Walmart and trying to buy five Roku devices, the TV streaming boxes. And they, and they said, we're sorry, we're limited to three, a customer. They have like 25 of them on the rack and I want five of them. And I'm like, and they're, they said, I'm sorry, look, beep, 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 dur, 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 dur. after we scan three, we can't sell you another one. And I'm like, why don't you have that for cards? I'm like, why? <laughs> you have they it should. for Roku's. I mean, like, why don't you have that for cards? Yeah, so I no, think they there's should. a lot they could be doing um, in those cases. So, I mean, I love the fact that, like, if kids can go in there and pick up a pack, that's huge. I made two Instagram accounts because of this whole notion. One's called $5 cards, one's called $10 cards. 
And the, I just put on affordable cards of great players so that people can pick up a Kevin Durant or a LeBron James or a Michael Jordan card for five bucks and not have to deal with this crazy market that makes it totally unaffordable for them. Um, and those accounts, like I don't make a lot of money on those at all. Like maybe a dollar a card, 50 cents a card. And it's a ton of effort. It's hours of work. But I love the amount of messages, the DMs I get on Instagram, the thank yous, because people are actually getting cards. It's like the nostalgia factor for the people that are older. And then the kid factor where they're like, I can't, I haven't been able to get a pack at Target, but I got my favorite player now out of that set. So this is awesome. Yeah, it's just awesome. You know, so I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do my part to make stuff available for them because I feel for it. You know, it's just, it's ugly and, and I don't even buy packs. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> back in 2017 and 2018, I was doing a, a, a piece of artwork. It was a 16 by 20 Aaron judge uh, uh, portrait. It was like a mosaic of, of all of, um, of his rookie card using cards that were cut up from that series. I think it was like 2017 top series Ooh. one or something like that. Or series yeah. two. Crazy tedious, right? But you need the cards in order to create your artwork. So yeah. I would go to the store and like shelves would just be loaded with cards. And I'd pick up a couple just so that I could maybe get some more reds or some more blues that I could get. But I always just remember seeing these shelves just literally stocked with so oh, many yeah. cards and like nobody yeah. was buying them. And now you can't, again, like you said, you can't even go to the store and buy them, which this is a perfect way to tie into this next thing that I want to do with you. The day that I went to go pick up one of these packs of cards when I knew that we were going to be doing this podcast, yeah. I went and there's a, a, there's a dude, he like had a skateboard, his cell phone out <laughs> in like the card section, just like you could just tell what he was doing. Like he was just searching the cards, what was yep. what. And, um, and I found this one pack that I bought. So that we could open it. Nice, dude. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but uh, you're so lucky I found you can't find one. those anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. No. So well, the guy ended up. Uh, so I, I bought this one, uh, and when I saw the guy at first, he I think he had like baseball or something like that. But there were a couple of blaster boxes of these. Yeah. And when I came back, I saw that, like you said, if you go back five minutes later, all of them will be taken. So this dude had, you could tell that he was just a flipper, which is what is ruining this whole hobby for a lot of the young kids. So I got this one. So everybody at home who's watching this, uh, we're going to open this pack of cards. If you're listening to this, I'm going to open it. I'll try to show you or, or tell you who we get in this pack as much as possible. And then I guess kind of just go through John, that yeah. is, of, of what I should be looking for, reactions, if it's cool, if it's not cool what I should put into a penny sleeve than a top loader, which is the safety case for, for these cards. Dude, there's so many things. I just, I remember when it just used to be opening up a pack and that was it, but yeah, total ASMR awesome, right here for uh, the ASMR folks out there. <laughs> you do a whole episode ASMR talking whispers, scratch the mic. I should have done my nails for this. Speaking of scratching. <laughs> All right. So we got, Goran Drag, oh man, dude, I'm probably gonna Goran Dragic. Yep, butcher so many of these names. Gary Harris. Good. Yep. Matthew Delladova. Yep. Derek White. Mm-hmm. And again, this is 2020, 2021 NBA hoops. Derek Rose. Nice. Is it? He's on the Knicks on there or no? Uh, uh, Detroit Pistons. Yeah, Detroit. Yep. Yep. I was going to say, I saw the blue uniform. Like, they couldn't have had a Knicks card yet. See, that's the cool thing about your eye about that is that, like, just depending upon the picture, if it's a team that you like or if it's, like, a cool, like, he was on the Pistons for not that long. It's like, oh, that's actually yeah. kind of cool. Yep. Markel Fultz. Yep. Man, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even. Uh, oh, yeah. Shane Gilders Alexander. Yeah, he's good. What? Say it yep. one more time. Shea Gilgis Alexander. Shea Gilgis Alexander. All right. He's <laughs> good. Talk, talk about a name. Hassan Whiteside. I know that dude. Yep. Yep. He's good. Uh, Jonas Valen Valenzuelas. Yeah. He's okay. Yep. There, there, some people would say he's very good. All right. So I got some that are like upside down. So I'll do this. Yeah. No, you're getting into the insert realm now. 
All right, so how'd you know that? How did you know that I was going to the insert realm? So a lot of times they format packs in a way that they will, um, they'll put a lot of base up front and then they're going to hit into, anytime you start to see them kind of flip over is usually when they've inserted something special into the pack. Um, and a lot of these packs will have at least like some sort of holographic card or a numbered card. Occasionally you can get an autograph card or a memorabilia card, I believe too. Okay, so everybody out there watching and listening, when you get to that part of the pack, be a little bit extra careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Dwayne Bacon. That's a cool name. Dwayne Bacon. Yep. Mitchell Robinson. That he's he's great on the Knicks. Cool. That's actually right here, Duncan. Yep. Dwight Powell. Yep. Derek Favors. Yep. Marcus Smart. Nice. Marcus Morris Sr. Yep. Damian Lillard. This is a pretty cool one. Rip City. Lillard's great. Yep, Lillard's a good one. Kobe White. Kobe White's also very uh, desirable as well. Oh, cool. You want it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it to you. <laughs> Marky, <laughs> Marky's Chris. Cool. Oh, snap. Here we go. Um, yeah, I'll start to get in a foil there, probably. Shake Milton. Mm-hmm. Terrence Davis. Yep. Wes Barton. This is like, or Will Barton. This is kind of purple around the side. Yeah. So that's a, that's going to be a shorter print. Some of them are numbered. Some of them aren't when they do that, but that's, so when you see the purple border on the bottom, a lot of these cards, it's hard. Like uh, Prism, I think had 38 variations last year. Like wh what? So some person that's trying to get like the base card, but in all 38 flavors, and you're spending like a year trying to track down all of the cards. That's nuts. It's the same picture, but like they just do a different effect on every card. It's it is. It's completely insane. But yeah, jeez. Frequent flyers. Cool. Nice. So that's that's either an insert or a subset, depending on how it's numbered on the back. So if it's number, if it says like FF something, versus uh oh, let me bring that. Yeah. So that would I would say that's that's probably a subset. It says number thirteen. Um, difference between an insert and a subset is a subset is part of the official set. Okay. So like you consider it part of like, if you got a box set that would be in it. And then an insert is something that's separate from the set, a rarer card that has its own set. Okay. So. Gotcha. Wow. Cool. Vanity plates. Devin yes. Booker. Nice. So that's a good one. All right. So this one kind of looks a little bit extra shiny. Yep. All right. And then also too, like I've seen this before while doing research, people like open up these, like if they know cool cards coming, They'll do yeah. like that, like yes, the reveal, kind of like yep. the yeah, the reveal. Ooh, lights, camera, action! I can't see who it is though. Damian Lillard. Oh, good dude, that's and it's one. like shiny. Yeah, so that's an insert. Lights, camera, action is an insert. Cool, a shiny one, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tower point during the entire episode of collecting something that you love and that you know. Again, I'm a baseball guy. I don't really know basketball yep. as much, so John's going to know so much more about these players and probably find it more enjoyable than I would just because, like, I think it would be cool if I got, like, a Ronald Acuna Jr. or something like that. Yeah. But that goes to the point of how this should be a hobby and something that you love. Emmanuel yep. quickly. Yep. Anthony Edwards. He's pretty good, right? Yep. So that's his rookie card. Sadiq Bey. Yeah, the rookies are all at the back of these packs, so you're going to have a bunch of rookies now, which is cool. So you'll also notice they put a little rookie badge on the top right of each one of those to tell you that they're rookie cards. It's all a cheat sheet that Panini does. Yeah, they make that pretty obvious with the uh, with how big it is. It's like almost like bigger than the uh, than the logo <laughs> on the top left, right? It that's is. Kinda, <laughs> they're really fun. trying to accentuate that you got a rookie card, but <laughs> that's one of the great things about these packs. They they stack them full. You got like five right in the back. You're going to get five rookies in a pack. Okay. You know, they're kind of feeding it in the. I think I feel bad for the card company and I never used to say that, but like in a situation like today, like they get a lot of flack for someone that, so that pack that you spent, I don't know if that was like a $10 pack when you got it originally in target five. five. Okay. That's great. So $5 is, is a great price for that. That car, that in my local card shop would sell for 25 to $30 just to give you an idea that unopened pack, like they would have it sitting there and at 25 to $30 when someone opens it, and they get what you got, they'd be like, uh, oh, I got the lights, camera, action, which could be maybe a five, $10 card. You know, we have to see, you got a few rookies. 
But for $25, you would have been like, man, I really missed out on that. Whereas for $5, you got a great pack. So they're priced, they're, they're, they, what they put in the pack is based on what they're supposed to sell for, <laughs> not what they have been driven to the extreme on. With all the and speculation what, and all the hype. Exactly. You know, and so it, it's um, when you can find them in retail, it's great. You know, you can open it up. You're going to get the value out of them almost every time, or at least most of the time. When you find them, you know, in a local card shop, you're taking more of a gamble because it's already so far removed from the original price, unfortunately. Interesting. Yeah. So if you, again, if you get your hands on these types of cards for $5 a piece, do it, but do it in a, in, in limited quantities so that everybody can do it. Do it in a responsible way. Yeah. And pick up the sports that you want too, right? Like, again, like to your point, like, you know, if, if you're not a, if you're not a baseball guy, don't buy all the baseball stuff up, you know, cause you're not going to know what you get when you open it. And then what's the point, you know, or you're not going to get any enjoyment out of it. Exactly. Um, Especially you know, if one so. of these cards could be graded. And like, I have no idea that like Anthony yeah. Edwards is as good as he is. I do know because of general sports knowledge, but like yeah. maybe if you don't know, you end up throwing that card out or like yeah. just like tossing it somewhere on your couch or something, then it gets banged up. And then the, this entire time you could have had a thousand dollar card. That that's the Giannis story. All, all you know like summed up in one Giannis Antetokounmpo was like his cards no one knew who he was his rookie year and, and I mean honestly I how crazy this is I was looking through my stuff the other day in my drawer and I found this box the I had two boxes and they were wow. not labeled and so I was like I have no idea what these are and I opened it up and I'm like oh interesting like at the face of it it was just these it was some rookie cards out of Panini that are totally unrelated and I guess I just had them in there for packing. But then the other cards I'm here, I'm like, oh, these are prism cards. These are like the expensive, you know, like the expensive set. And I'm like, wait a minute, this was Giannis's rookie year. So I went through this box and I literally bought this entire set, probably for $25 or $30 back in 2013. Because that's, you know, the sets weren't expensive, the base sets. And there was no one like really great in it. And sure enough, there's the Giannis rookie. And it's an $800 to $1,000 card raw just sitting in this box that's so cool so you you never know and so i say treat all the cards well anyway because you don't know you could have a guy that's i mean think about kobe bryant even i mean we knew he was 13th pick you know people knew he was a good player but he didn't really become kobe bryant until 1997 like 96 he, he was not the front runner everyone was talking about iverson you know and and so the, the fact, even in those things, like if you had kind of tossed his cards aside, he wasn't even in the draft pick sets because they only did the top 10. So like a lot of people just like, they got a card of his and were like, okay, he's okay. You know, whatever. Um, we'll see. He's on the Lakers, whatever, you know, but like, if you had tossed that aside, you, it's crazy. It's insane now to see what they go for. And you yeah. just don't know. So I always say treat all the cards with respect. You know, you want to put them in a nice box, even if you don't put them all in soft sleeves, you got a nice box to stack them all in because someday you may see a player strike it really big and you go uh, like Julius Randall, all of a sudden, you know, on the Knicks, he's playing amazing. And here for all these years, his cards were not that, not that expensive, not that worth anything. Um, so I have stuff of him that I've dug up. I actually have a card that's signed by him and Kobe, which is just crazy. And before was a really cheap card because he kind of brought the card down. That's the funny thing about dual autographs. One player can actually bring the value down. Um, but I, I now it's like up because people are really into him and they're like, oh man, <laughs> they both they both touched the card. This is cool, you know? So you just never know. You never know, you know? That's the beauty of it. So that's actually a great lesson to be learned for all the viewers and the listeners out there. And, and, and again, something else value-wise that John has brought to the table this afternoon with us. So before we let you go and before we get into the bonus content, what are your social media platforms where everybody can follow you, uh, take part in purchasing some of these five or ten dollar cards that are sure. hard to find, and 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 people can grow their collections and also to just follow along your journey because it's been such a great one for shoot thirty some years now of, yeah. of of your collecting journey. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, so Instagram, I've got three Instagrams. My main one is basketball card guy, all one word. So basketball card guy. Um, I then have two for the discount card. So I've got $5 cards with the number five and then just dollar cards spelled out that way. So at $5 cards, and then I have at $10 cards all spelled out. So T E N dollar cards. 
um, there. And those two I update, I try and do them once a week. Um, you have to turn on notifications on those two, on the $5 and $10 ones. I literally post a card. I mean, in five to 10 seconds, the card goes. It literally five to every card I post. Well, I'm sure that a lot of the knowledge and your stories and insight that you've brought to us this afternoon on this podcast will definitely help out a lot of people, whether they're just getting into the hobby or have been in it for a long time. So, John, dude, thank you so much for your time, man. You that was it. great. And everybody out there, just keep on collecting and definitely shoot the basketball guard guy a follow on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And like you said, visit his website. He's got a lot of great stuff. And John, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for watching that episode of Keep Swing. Man, we have so many more awesome guests on the way, and I don't want you to miss any of it. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, feel free to go back and watch past episodes. And again, if you subscribe to the channel, that is the best way to find out who we are going to have on the show next. And if there's a guest that you want on the show, I will do all that I can to have him or her come on. So please leave a comment. Let me know who you want to see on Keep Swing coming up. And also, too, feel free to leave a comment what you thought about the episode in the comment section below. Give it a like. And if you head over to Instagram, I'll be posting clips from all these interviews. Just a little daily inspiration. And there you can interact with me as well. Until then, have an awesome day and keep swinging.